<laughs> Thank you for your help. Thank you for your help. You know, good morning. You know, I, I think Jason wanted me to preach the same sermon as last week. You know, the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. You know, one of these days, everything's going to be clear. You know, we will know him as we are fully known. One of these days, it's everything's going to be new. Okay? Can, you, can you imagine having everything wiped away? I mean, all regret, all forgiveness. I mean, just, just everything made new. I mean, it's so hard sometimes you, we, we, we dwell on the things that, of the past, what, what's been done to us and what we've done to other people. And someday, someday, it's, we're going to have a new beginning. It's going to be just like God planned it from the start, you know. Um, Anyways, uh, I had a theory last week that uh, is is full of holes uh, this week because I, I I thought, you know, if I go to Arizona, you send me to Arizona, it'll snow. And so this week I stayed and it still snowed. So um, this next week I'm going to try something new. Uh, Well, maybe not new, but uh, Kat and I, we're going to go to Florida uh, next week. So uh, hope it snows like crazy here, right? Hope it snows like crazy. But are we worthy? You know, I I asked several of you, uh, how are you? And, uh, you know, several of you say, you know, better than I deserve, right? (laughs) Better than I deserve. And, you know, it's so easy to make a quick assessment of who we are compared to this holy God and and conclude we're, we're, we're worthless. No, God, God had pity on these worthless scum of the earth individuals and sent his only one and begotten son because he, 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 he just had pity on us. And, and his, there's nothing else he could do for us but to die on the cross so that we could have eternal life. You know, we can, we can get caught up in a mindset to that. You know, I heard this the other day at pastor's conference. There's nothing I can do to make God love me more. And there's nothing I can do to make God love me less. You know, we, we, we won't find this phrase anywhere in the Bible. Other phrases like, you know, God helps those who help themselves and cleanliness is next to godliness. You know, nothing against these phrases. But we won't find these. They're, they're not scripture. And we can oversimplify, or I should say, maybe uh, get one-sided view of how things are, or, or just, just like a two-dimensional. You know, this Bible is active and living, and it, it not only, it not only is, is got contrast and depth, we can walk in it, and it can penetrate us. We search for something, and we can't see the forest for the trees. Jesus said that these scriptures all talk of him. And we often grasp a thought and a process everything through our perspective, wish, or desire. And we can easily have a thought pattern that blinds us to what God really wants to get across. We know that passage out of Acts 17.11, you know, of the Bereans, they, they received the message with readiness of mind. They they were more noble than those of Thessalonica and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And we we need to we need to look at this the scripture with with hey, you know, what is God trying to say? Where is my place? How what what was God's plans for me? And what does he want to get across to me? You know, that's one of the issues I even talked to Tyson about the Bible. You know, I'm ready to defend my predisposition of what I think the Bible says. But my mind is not ready to see if what he thinks of the Bible is so. And so we spent, I don't know, about 15 minutes the other day discussing, you know, whether... (laughs) I forget what we were discussing, but 
He had, a, he had this wall up, and I had this wall up. It was a good discussion, you know, and he had wonderful passages to, to defend his opinion, and I had wonderful passages to defend my opinion, you know. And What, what was it about, again? Worthy. Where, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, worthy, yeah, maybe. This Bible is spiritually discerned. And if we regard sin in our lives, the Lord will not hear us, and we open ourselves to deception. You know, out of the passage we read from Jeremiah 15, 19, uh, this is what the Lord says, If you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. Let, let's turn to Matthew 13, 44. One of the things that I heard growing up was... Uh, you know, always tell the truth, and you won't have to think about what you have to say. You won't have to process this, oh, man, you know, what kind of story am I building up? What, and, and, and try to keep in line with the story. You, you just be open. You know, that's not biblical phrase either. But, but follow me a bit on this line. Transparency is the best way to read God's Word. With readiness of mind, if we're harboring sins... Those will twist this scripture just like a lie will cause you to remember, try to remember, or think of ways to perpetuate that story, that lie. Let's, 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 let's open up ourselves. Who, I, who am I? What am I? Really, God, you see me, and naked I stand before you. Let's just, let's, let's just do this this moment. And say, hey, just, just, just like, you know, this is, this is you unmasking yourself to God right now. Just, just like pre pretend that, 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 that you really fooled God into thinking that you were a cool person. And now he all of a sudden sees everything. And you say, God, where am I? Where am I? You must, if we harbor sins and if we, I think that's what it was. It was hypocrisy. No, no. I, it'll come to me. It'll come to me what we did. But the scenario of you pretending to be or didn't do instead of just, just drop the truth and be transparent. If we're not truthful to who we are, Scripture will be clouded as well. And when we state often, you know, that I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Or, or there's, there's nothing I can do to make Jesus love me more, nothing I can do to make Jesus love me less. You know, it, it can lead to a complacency to, to excuse sin. And, and so I, I, I want to put things in a balance and a perspective and, and, and an understanding where God wants us. And, and there's, there's, this, there's this, I don't know, this, this friction that we need to be place, place ourselves in. It's, a, it's not that those ideas are false. There just needs to be a contrast to balance and to bring out the depth to our lives in Jesus. You know, there's a place for this observation of unworthiness, but it must be balanced out with our worth in Jesus. You know, last week we read that Jesus endured the cross because of the, the joy set before him. In Hebrews 12, in the parable right after he tells the parable of the wheat and the tares, here's, here's Matthew, Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went out and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is, is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is, is like a net that was let down into a lake that, and caught all kinds of fish. And when it was full, the fishermen pulled it up to shore. And then he sat down and collected the good fish in the baskets, but threw the bad away. This, will be, this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like an owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. As well as old. Please, let's turn to John 1.19. You know, you know it, it's easy to focus in on our unworthiness. You know, it, it's, there it is, flat in our face. But there's something great about you. There's something great about you. There's something special about who God created you to be. And although it was a lost treasure, it is a recoverable treasure. Jesus just didn't die on the cross so that those who believe on him could only make it to heaven one day. Jesus died because you were worth it. You were worth it. You know, Kat and I went to a truck dealership a couple of weeks ago. We were, we were looking, looking for a truck, truck to, to, to pull, pull our trailer. trailer. And, and uh, we, 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 we spotted a Tundra. And it was, it was basically the best deal I ever saw at a dealership. And uh, so we test drove it and checked it out and everything like that. And, and uh, then we said, hey, will you accept this and this for this truck? And they said, no, no. We're not, We're not dropping, dropping the price anything. anything. This, this truck, truck is worth it. it. This, this truck, truck is, is worth it. it. And uh, after it did, I mean, even a buck, you know? <laughs> and then he looked at, he says, we got some financing options for you. And I said, well, uh, I told him, you know, I just needed to pull my trailer. And, and for that price, it wasn't worth it to me. And so I bought a trailer hitch for my van. Or, or, or a hitch kit for my van for under 400 bucks. It saved, saved a considerable amount of money. Uh, we'll see how that works. <laughs> but, uh, but even in these parables, there's a, there's a balance. There's some that are worthless fish, weeds, and wickedness that would be thrown out and be burnt. But there is some good treasure, wheat, fish, treasure, and righteousness that are worth everything. I mean, this, this, these parables, they, 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 this, this merchant, this farmer, they sold everything for that treasure. They sold everything for that pearl. Not because, oh man, that poor pearl, it's, it's just dirty and filthy. And No, it was valuable. It was valuable. The truck wasn't worth it to me. The Tundra, the Toyota Tundra. But if it, Jesus sold everything for you, you're worth it. Just a thought. If Jesus paid it all for that treasure, shouldn't we take that hint and give all what we have for that treasure? I mean, if Jesus thought it was worth it, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and Omega the creator of everything. And he said, this treasure, you're, you're, you're worth it. That should give us a little hint, say, hey, maybe the life he had planned for it is worth it. Maybe I, I should follow that plan. In John 1, 19, it says, now this was John's testimony. When the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, the prophet. No. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John replied in the words of Isaiah, the prophet, I am a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophets? And just, just kind of a side note of the originality of baptism here. You know, this wasn't, they said, you know, he was, he was a son of Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest, and the priest did these ceremonial washings, you know, these old ceremonial washings. This was something new. Something new that they looked forward to, Christ, Elijah, or a prophet. 
baptism of repentance. It was new. In verse 24, Now some of the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you're not the Christ, or Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now let's turn to Luke 7.22. John, he says, man, I, he, he didn't even see Jesus yet. Well, in, in, in my perspective, he didn't, he didn't see Jesus and the, and the voice of heaven calling out, saying, this is my son who I'm well pleased, and, and, the, and the dove falling on his head like, I mean, the Holy Spirit falling on his head like a dove. He just said, I know that when he comes, I'm not going to be able to unloose his sandals. I'm unworthy. He didn't just throw up his hands, though, and, and just float along in life with a mantra like, there's nothing I can do to make God love me more. There's nothing I can do to make God love me less. John gave everything for this treasure. And Jesus made the statement that there is no one greater in, in, uh, in Luke 7, 22. So he replied to the messengers, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. This is the one of whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you and will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Okay. Please let's turn to 1 Timothy 1.13 greatest. John is the greatest uh, born among women. You know, uh, this word has depth. It's active and living. And, and we can journey through it and it can penetrate our lives as well. You know, this is a place for understanding our unworthiness. And at the same time, we must grasp the intent of our lives when God preordained good works that we should walk in them. We must understand that we are worth dying for so we can live holy and upright lives. You know, although Paul calls himself the worst of sinners in 1 Timothy 1, 13, he, it says, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying, and, and that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners... Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. How you doing? <laughs> Better than I deserve. That's it. Definitely. You know, Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. And while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. But even Job, Daniel, repented in dust and ashes, and, and, and Isaiah cried out, Woe to me! You know, when he saw in the presence, woe to me! 
For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory. Woe to me. You know, this should be our first response to God. I'm mean, just, just imagining, you know, being in God's presence. But the fear should not debilitating or debilitate us from becoming worthy. God's grace chips away the tarnish, washes away the sin, cuts away the imperfections, and exposes holiness and righteousness. We can be as holy as God is holy by grace, by the grace, the work of the Holy Spirit, and the preordained plans of God. You know, and Paul goes on in Ephesians 3. Eight, although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this ministry, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. So, you know, Isaiah, you know, he, he said, Woo me! But then, God angel sent a coal and touched his lips with it and he says now you're clean now you're clean and, and i like this 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 last last verse in him and through faith in him we may approach god with freedom and confidence because we're worth it god made you worth it god preordained your life your good works to be worth it god planned your eternity your ever existence with god to be a treasure, to be a, to be a pearl, to be something God is looking at and says, wow. And then he, he goes to a storehouse, his storehouse of heaven, and he, and, he, and he brings out, you know, new treasures as well as old. And he said, wow, look at this. Woohoo! I died for this. I gave up everything for this. And you're my treasure. We can come and approach God with freedom and confidence. Let's, let's turn to Ephesians 4, the next chapter. You know, God isn't here just to recover or salvage junk. You know, I like that the other phrase that's unbiblical, God doesn't make any junk, you know. He sold everything he had. He emptied himself, became a man, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, for a treasure that was worthy of everything he was. You know, certainly it's not works of ourselves that we can boast. You know, look what I did. It's a gift of God from his earliest original intent through his searching for what was lost and who for the joy set before him endured the cross, redeemed that life from destruction to reconcile us to himself and to complete that work through the Holy Spirit. He that has begun a good work will complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. And, and he's going to chill, he's going to expose it, he's going he's gonna to pressure, he's going to whatever, uh, uh, create us to be his treasure. In Ephesians 4, 1, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be that treasure. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And I was talking to 
to Rob McCaleb about this, this belt that he, he found in a, in a thrift store. And uh, he was fiddling with some belts, and then one of the belt hit something metal, and it goes clunk. And whoa. This is a, well, he looked at the price, and, and he had it checked out, you know, later on, and it was sterling silver. He said, whoa, did I make a good find? I wonder why Jesus used pearls to describe the treasure. Do you know how a pearl is formed? I just got this. A natural pearl, often called an oriental pearl, forms when an irritant works its way into a particular species of oysters, muzzle, or clam. As a defense mechanism, the mollusk secretes a fluid to coat over the irritant. Layer upon layer of this coating is deposited on the irritant until the lustrous pearl is formed. I don't know. <laughs> Look at yourself as an irritant. And God covers us with his love. You know, and John, I'm, in, I'm feeling some, some cool chills right now. <laughs> irritant. He lavished his love on us. The, 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 the treasure is, is the love. Layer upon layer deposited on this irritant until this lustrous pearl is formed. You know, my brother was a part of a pipe organ built in, uh, in uh, Pacific Lutheran University. And, uh, and uh, one, one of, of the, the things, things they, they, they learned is, is, is the, the, the best sounding pipe organs in all of Europe were made of a certain type of metal. And that metal was crudely refined back in the 14th century. The designers at the university, the, the builders of this organ, had to take this pure metal and restructure it with some impurities and then build the pipes so that they could try to reverse engineer the sound of the beautiful pipes of that, that organ in Europe, that ancient organ, so that you replicate it. Could the pure, perfect intent for each of us recast in the flesh, lost in the world and tainted by spiritual darkness, resound and even more glorious song through the redemption and power of God's mercy, grace, justice, and holiness. And what if this whole fall thing, this whole and all we knew was the Garden of Eden. What if we, Adam, had never chosen the other way and known the way of, I don't know. God had a plan. And he knew from before the foundation of the earth, before this dust was formed and before he breathed into us that this son, Jesus, it was already written in the stars that Jesus was going to pay the price to redeem a fallen world. This huge treasure that Jesus buried and then went out and sold everything he had so that he could go and dig it back up again. Interesting thought. Just, just think about that. I want to hear your response. Check it out. Each one of us believers has been plucked from the flames, is being refined in the fire and reformed as a pottery to be a vessel that proclaims the unsearchable riches of Christ with the mysterious 
process of creation, the fall, the redemption, the regeneration, and finally, the completed church, a bride without spot and prepared for her husband. You know, only God can make something so worthless, so worthy. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you and we thank you for your word. Lord, it is, like Paul says, I proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. It's so rich, it's so full, it's so immense and dense and, and contrasting. And Lord, there's, there's, there's no end to the journey that is before us. Lord, as we journey through this, Lord, I pray and ask, you know, as we, we, we see, yeah, there's, there's, there, there's a sense of definite unworthiness. We are unworthy to even loose and stand, to, to sit, to kneel, to lay flat on our face before you. God, we're so unworthy. But at the same time, you have brought us to the point where we can walk boldly before you. And you call us your treasure. You give us our worth. May we long for that treasure in us, the, the love that you convey to us and, and the, the fullness of you, what you want us to be. Lord, I ask this and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.